MLB is enjoying its best crowds in over a decade while fighting in court over its broadcasting future. Plus, Pat McAfee still doesn't have a contract for the coming season of College Game Day, and many Charlotte residents want David Tepper to pay for his own stadium renovations with a vote on that looming. It's Thursday, June 20th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Two months before the college football season begins, Pat McAfee still doesn't have a contract with ESPN's College Game Day, according to The Athletic. McAfee has been more open than most people about his contract status. Last October, The Athletic put out a poll showing that nearly half of Game Day watchers do not enjoy his presence on the show, to which he responded on X saying, I have heard you all very loud and clear since the beginning of my stint with Game Day. It's one of the biggest reasons why I have not re-signed a contract with the legendary show. I'm not right for some crowds, and the distinguished college football folks are definitely one of those. Adding to the intrigue is that ESPN signed one of the very biggest names in college football over the offseason. Nick Saban had barely left the office from his historic run as Alabama's coach before the network brought him in as part of the Game Day crew. He will join Kirk Herbstreet, Lee Corso, Reese Davis, Desmond Howard, and perhaps McAfee next season. For what it's worth, Herbstreet went on the Pat McAfee show last year and said that if McAfee left game day, he would follow him out the door. ESPN has a separate contract to air the Pat McAfee show, which has, of course, also been a massive source of controversy for the network. As many predicted, McAfee is one of ESPN's biggest draws and biggest headaches. This week, the Charlotte City Council opened up for public comment on its proposal to help revamp the Panther Stadium, and many are not thrilled about the concept. The team and the city agreed in principle to split the cost of a $1.3 billion renovation. Some spoke out in favor of investing in the stadium, while others pointed out that Tepper has a net worth north of $20 billion, according to Forbes, and can afford his own renovations. The deal would also come with a promise that the Panthers stick around until 2039, which some have argued is too short of a commitment given the city's investment. Should the city decide that the deal is too unpopular or a poor use of its limited funds, Tepper may at least threaten to relocate. He hasn't given any indication around that yet, but it is the standard negotiating ploy for owners in these situations. The city council is set to vote on the proposal on Monday. Whole lot going on in the world of baseball as we head into the summer. Joining me now to discuss is Front Office Sports Newsletter co-author Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. So great to have you back on. Um, let's start with Father's Day weekend. MLB had uh, one of its its best attended weekends in a, a long, long time. Any just top line reactions to to the big weekend? Yeah, really confirmatory of what we've been seeing really since the beginning of last year. There's been, uh, you know, really strong fan reaction to the new rules that were put in last year, namely the pitch clock, uh, but also the larger bases and the ban on extreme defensive shifts that, you know, if you buy a ticket to a Major League Baseball game, you're not necessarily making a four hour time commitment. Right. (laughs) Uh, You're going to see more action uh, during that time that you're there. And. We had a big attendance increase last year, almost 10 percent. And, you know, these big weekends like we've seen so far this year just really kind of continued on that. Now, we've also had this past weekend a number of good matchups, Yankees, Red Sox, Cubs, Cardinals, Orioles, Phillies. There were some attractive matchups, but really the bigger story is that fans really are continuing to embrace uh, this shorter, more action filled version of the game that the league is now selling. Yeah, I mean. It does really show that it wasn't just the novelty of last year of, oh, things are a little different. Let's go check out a game. Yeah, because we did see a nice big bump last year. That's held. You know, it looks like yep. it's just a product that fans are, are happier to see. It, it moves faster. You're more likely to see action. There are more stolen bases, which are a lot of fun. Yep. Um, yeah, we had nine in one game, one of these Yankee oh, Red wow. Sox <laughs> games. Uh, yeah, but this is what you're signing up for now. And, it, and again, it's, it's held and, and then some. Because, again, when you buy a ticket, you sort of know what you're in for now. Yeah. Worth noting, not to, you know, I don't think this was a dramatic effect or anything, but on that big Father's Day weekend, the A's, Marlins, Rays, and White Sox were all on the road. Um, Not that that they would have truly, like, weighed down the attendance, but those are perhaps the four worst drawing teams. Certainly the, the A's are down there. Anyway, it's um, Certainly you're talking about a quartile for sure. And that, yeah. that is fair. You would have had 
having those teams on the road probably makes the difference between this being a nice weekend and like the best weekend in 15 years, which is the kind yeah. of level that we got to. Uh, but again, over any sort of larger period of time, those larger trend lines are holding. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's hop over to um, sort of the the flip side of, of all the, the MLB news, sort of the the, which is like the the less exciting stuff, or not the less exciting. The uh, <laughs> let me just take that again. more complicated. <laughs> more complicated is better. Um, take two on that transition. Um, let's hop over to a, a very different topic, which is what's going on in the courts. A uh, sort of a thornier topic in the world of baseball. So Diamond Sports Group is still in bankruptcy proceedings. Of course, yep. is baseball and hockey and basketball's primary regional sports network broadcaster or owner of those networks anyway um the latest twist of this has to do with diamond's desire to keep private contracts that it has with the major cable companies charter cox mm -hmm. they're now defunct deal with comcast what's this fight all about here so we're getting to the end of the line here in terms of this bankruptcy proceeding that Diamond is trying to reorganize and we have a hearing at the end of next month to confirm that plan that was supposed to happen this month, but it got delayed. Uh, but as part of that sort of final confirmation, the leagues have sort of a one last chance, one last big chance to formally object to that reorganization or not. And to make that decision as to whether or not they're for going to formally re object to this plan, they want a lot more information. This is principally baseball, but also the NBA and the NHL. And to make that assessment as to what they're going to do between now and the end of July, object, not object, they would like all this additional information. And part of that additional uh, uh, request for information is all of these television contracts. Where the rub there is, is that those deals contain all sorts of privacy provisions that not only Diamond, but the cable companies themselves would like to keep under wraps. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can see this from both sides here, but I feel like, I, in a way, it's kind of amazing that these contracts, that this is just becoming an issue right now. Um, it shows you sort of the strength of these privacy provisions, because mm -hmm. these contracts seem at the very core of the issue here, which is how much money can Diamond make on these broadcasts? And is it Are going they to be sustainable be going forward? Bankruptcy. That's really the fundamental question that we're all trying to answer here. The leagues and everybody else, is this going to be a viable co company on the other side? And that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I was going to say what's at stake in, in this, this, um, you know, these proceedings, which I'll, I'll still throw you that question, but it feels like, you know, the future of local sports broadcasting is what's at stake. Yeah, and and to that end, one of the uh, single largest, and in some cases, the single largest revenue stream for the teams involved. That's really what's at stake is the president. What is the RSN model going to look like? And they're at the tip of the spear because they're the largest RSN operator. What does that economic model look like? And again, for the teams involved, what does this crucial revenue stream look like? And so, you again, you can see the point of view of the teams. They really want as much information, the leagues, they want as much information as they possibly can to make these informed decisions as to whether or not to object. Um, but again, the, the, the cable business traditionally is operated under sort of a cloak of secrecy and confidentiality. So these two things are just coming into direct conflict, heightened by the time pressure of the fact that we essentially got about five and a half, six weeks before we get to this finish line one way or another. Yeah. And for MLB, this feels like an even bigger issue. I mean, the NBA, so we know it, they're going to be fine. Um, you know, they're, they're going to triple roughly their, um, their national media rights revenue. Um, but with baseball, the local games are a, a very large percentage of their Huge. media revenue, of their total revenue. Yep. And, you know, if you're the Cincinnati Reds, the Arizona Diamondbacks, you know, the, the, bottom half of the team and half of the teams in terms of popularity um this is kind of what makes the whole thing tick you know you're not going to be able to keep up you make money yankees yeah right yeah attendance by itself is not going to do it uh you're you're the occasional appearance on a sunday night baseball or something that's that's not 
not going to get you there. Na- that this, national money is all shared regardless anyway. Right. So, uh, yeah, this this is a very critical revenue stream. And we're, you know, we've got all these larger existential issues that we've talked uh, extensively about in terms of cord cutting and cord nevering and what the entire media model looks like. And then we've got this very particular microcosm that has all of these particular dramatic elements that I just described. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously it'll have effects around, you know, just the future of, of baseball media. Like, do they have a, a national streaming service that, that doesn't have the local blackouts where you can watch your local team. Right. If you, if you subscribe to the new MLB TV, obviously that can't happen. Well, um, well, diamond is, is still controls these rights. Uh, but I think a lot of, a lot of fans just want to be able to turn on their TV and, and watch their local team. That's how they've done it for decades. So, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's all sorts of, uh, thorny issues around this one. Um, let's hop once again to a different topic. So on Thursday, um, MLB is, has putting a game in Rickwood field in Birmingham, Alabama. This is a, a historic Negro leagues field between the Cardinals and giants, um, it's, you know, it's another big event that MLB is putting on and it's another, um, I think pretty thoughtful, uh, commemoration of the Negro leagues, you know, coming off the heels of them incorporating Negro league stats into their official records. Yeah, this is really part of a whole bigger strategy that the league has been doing for a number of years now in terms of special event domestic games. You've got the international games and the MLB world tour. That's a separate bucket, but in terms of these special events domestically, this is along the same lines of the Fort Bragg game a few years back, the two times they went to the Field of Dreams, uh, things they do with Little League and so on and so forth, that this is another one of these. Um, but this is a really cool thing that they're doing. And it's uh, also now from an event perspective, it ties into that larger strategy, but also for the league, this ties into a larger recognition of the great contribution that the Negro leagues have made to the sport. We just had a situation recently where, a key part of uh, the years of the Negro Leagues were just incorporated officially into uh, the baseball leaderboard statistically. So you had all sorts of changes in terms of who your all-time batting average and your all-time on-base percentage and those kind of leaders are. And Josh Gibson shot up you know, to the top of the list in a number of these categories because – what he did on the field and what others with him did on the field is now being formally and officially recognized. So that piece is happening in this game that they're doing with the giants and Cardinals is an extension of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an excellent point. Um, last topic. I, I'm really hopping all over the place with you here today. All good. Um, but, um, um, MLB just announced that they will be uh, using the challenge system for automated balls and strikes starting next week in triple a so they've been splitting games between some games it's just the robot calls balls and strikes some some games the batter can challenge uh if they think the umpire or i guess the pitcher can challenge as well what if they think the uh the human umpire made the wrong call they can go to the automated system so they're going full challenge system starting next week uh what are your thoughts here So this is part of a larger testing uh, effort uh, that's already been underway for some time and is continuing to go on by Major League Baseball to get the ABS system really up and running. Really what the ultimate goal line is, is to bring this technology at the Major League level. At the most recent owners meetings, uh, Commissioner Rob Manfred said that there have just been some operational bumps in the road, nothing serious, but they're continuing to try to really fine tune that system and be able to scale it up. We're looking at a major league implementation, probably 2026 or beyond. But what you've described is really just more part of that larger testing process so that when it does make that critical jump to the major league level, it's truly ready. Right. And it's a you know clear preference toward the testing system over just the fully automated system. So I think that's we are going to see it in MLB at some point. You know, 2026 seems like a a reasonable guess on that. And, uh, and it looks like that's what it's going to be. Yeah. And and again, the, the idea is just to get this as right as possible when it does make that jump. And and so they're, they're fine tuning the technology, just like a player, a coach, an umpire, a physical umpire, anybody else has got to do their time in the minors and get ready to make the jump. So to this technology. Yeah. And my guess is that we see the tennis progression of we go to the challenge system, we get used to that, that becomes normal. And then eventually we just say, you know what, 
it, it's fast enough. It's accurate enough. Let's just have the 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 robot ump as they they're called the robo ump just call everything. That feels like sometime in the 2030s would be my guess. Yeah, introduce and refine is is a time tested strategy, uh, not only for baseball but a lot of other properties. But even to s- sort of circle back to our first topic with the attendance, uh, even the pitch clock was refined this year for year two. Right. You know, some minor changes in terms of the how much time is on with both runners on base and runners not on base. Um, you know, so they had an introduction, there was some feedback, and then some refinements. And I would say the same strategy plays out here. Yeah, and of course the pitch clock also did its time in the minor leagues before, before it getting absolutely promoted. did. Eric Fisher, feel like I threw you the the fastball, the curveball, the changeup, and the knuckleball today. Thanks for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. That's it for today. Make sure you're subscribed wherever you like to tune in so you don't miss a beat. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.